if you, this is uh, a lecture for my eighth hour class on the 5th of April. And if you go to ISP, I'm going to be recording these, so there's no need for you to miss uh, anything. So make sure, or, you know, if you're just absent. Hello, how are you? Good. If I have any students down there, I'm starting to record this lecture right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, people get my ISP sounds like. Anyway, in American politics, there's a strain of anti intellectualism. We like our presidents to be intelligent, but we don't want to be too intelligent. You know, we like for them to be. You know, good old boys. We tend to think, you know, if we just get the right old boy up there in Washington, he'd straighten that mess out just like that. Um, and uh, you know, if you read too much, if you read too, we don't, we don't want these people to sit around reading books. We want people in a bit of action. You know, uh, when George W. Bush, and I'm not talking about George H. W. He's a very different president. But when George W. Bush ran in 2000, this campaign said, yeah, he was running around in cowboy boots and. He's a graduate of Yale, by the way, born wealthy to an Easter family in the East in Connecticut. And he's down in Texas and running around cowboy boots and a T-shirt. He's got a chainsaw. He's cutting wood. You know, they say, yeah, but George W. Bush, he's the kind of guy that you'd like to go sit on the back of your truck with and drink a beer with. Well, that sounds good, I guess, on the 4th of July. But that, and he, and he won, you know, he won. People said, oh, he's a common man. He's just like us. Uh, well, that, quote, common man got us involved in the war. It took us 20 years and 10,000 lives to get out of it. So I don't know about these good old boys that you'd like to sit on the back of the truck with and drink a beer. Drinking beer on the back of a truck is one thing. Being the president of the United States is something else. But that's what T.R. did with Wilson, because Wilson was a college professor. When Obama ran for president, what did the Republicans say about him? Oh, he's a college professor. Yeah, he was a college professor. He taught constitutional law. Uh, you know, I think the guy that uh, uh, succeeded him in the White House probably never read the Constitution. Uh, but yeah, Obama, he's an intelligent, you know, he was an intelligent man. Uh, we need intelligent people running this great big country. Uh, anyway, but there's a strain of anti-intellectualism. And Teddy Roosevelt's campaign was like this. While I was storming up San Juan Hill in the Spanish-American War, helping win that war, Woodrow Wilson was sitting in his office at Princeton University just bouncing ideas off the wall. You want a man of action or you want one of these bookworms, okay? That's that's what he said. Of course, they both attacked Taft. Roosevelt called poor Taft a fathead, okay? And Taft almost cried when that happened. Uh, you know, he was just such a nice guy. He just couldn't believe that Roosevelt had turned on him uh, like that. Uh, Roosevelt, there's a cartoon here I wanted to... Uh, Show this one right here. That's a great cartoon about this campaign. Uh, there they all are, the three candidates going up the hill trying to reach the White House. Woodrow Wilson, you see him. That's how professors dressed in those days in a tweed suit with the cap on. And he's on a donkey. A donkey is the symbol of the Democrat Party. You remember Thomas Nast and Boss Tweed? Yeah, you remember him? Well, Bo uh, Thomas Nast he was the first uh, um, c cartoonist to... Uh, make the donkey the symbol of the Democrat Party, it still is today. And of course, the Republican Party is the elephant. And there's Taft up on top of the elephant trying to go to the White House. And in the back, there's T.R. with his cowboy hat and his big stick. And he's on a bull moose, and the bull moose is biting the Republican elephant in the rear. Uh, so that's a great cartoon that comes from that campaign. But these three fought it out. But mainly, it was T.R. and Wilson. And uh, about two weeks, get this down, but about two weeks before Election Day, Roosevelt was scheduled to make a speech in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And thousands of people gathered in this auditorium to hear him. And there were so many people that a lot of people were standing outside, they couldn't get in. But uh, Roosevelt pulls up in a car, and he's going to walk into this auditorium, and... You know, it's about from here to those lockers on the other side of the hallway there. He's got to get out of the car and walk in the door. And the police just parted the crowd for him. And they're just standing like this pretty close. 
and he's walking and he's waving and smiling as he goes in to make his speech. And uh, this man, a uh, bartender, an insane bartender, you don't have to write his name down, but write down what he did. Uh, this man stepped out in front of TR, pulled out a pistol, and I mean he was as close to him as I am to you, pulled, pulled out a pistol, pointed it right at Roosevelt's chest, and shot him. Okay, he shot TR. And TR fell down and sort of rolled over and got back up. Uh, the bullet should have killed him. Uh, it went through his coat, it went through his vest, it took a piece of his tie, it took a piece of his shirt, it's heading straight for his heart. He had a 50 page speech, fold 50 pages of a speech folded up in his coat, so that slowed the bullet, but it didn't stop it. But the bullet on the way into his chest hit something that caused that deflect that deflected the bullet and caused it to go up, caused it to go up just a fraction. Just barely missed his heart. Serious enough, but just barely missed his heart. What did he have in his pocket that that bullet hit and caused it to slightly go up? If it hadn't been there, it would have gone in and would have killed him instantly. What was he carrying in his pocket? About 50 pages. What? Yeah. Well, the, 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 it went through the speech. The speech slowed it down, but something, it hit something else and deflected at the last minute. What? That's it. You know, you remember, Teddy Roosevelt never went anywhere without a spare pair of glasses. They told him, Colonel, and, and, and by the way, this guy, they dogpiled him, dragged him off to the police station, and they said, why did you shoot President Roosevelt? He said, well, last night I was asleep in my bed, and my room filled with light, and I sat up in the bed, and there was the ghost of William McKinley. Uh, and he told me that Roosevelt had been in on his assassination so that Roosevelt could become president. And, sit up, man. Sit up. I want to see your face. Anyway, um, he said. I, he said. He said that he was in on your assassination so he could become the president of the United States. Uh, and McKinley said, "I needed to kill him because Roosevelt was running for a third term and nobody deserves a third term." And they said, "Well, thank you very much." And packed him off to another room somewhere. But anyway, that was the end of him. He, I think, spends his life in prison. Uh, but it didn't kill Roosevelt. Roosevelt, by the way, wouldn't go to the hospital. I said, you got to go to the hospital. He said, no. He said, I'm scheduled to give this speech. And so he walks in. The audience inside didn't have any idea of what had happened outside. And Roosevelt sits in a chair on the stage. and Somebody gets up and does this long, long, long introduction. Roosevelt just sits there and listens. Then he gets up and they give him this thunderous applause. And before he starts his speech, he said, by the way, on the way in the auditorium, he pulled out his handkerchief and he had stuffed it in the bullet hole, okay, to try and stop the bleeding. And then he sits down with that long introduction, then he stands up. And then he start, before he starts his speech, he said, you know, on the way in here, um, a guy shot me. And they all just, ah, they all laughed. They said, you know, Roosevelt's going to make some sort of joke. And he said, no, I'm not kidding. The guy shot me. And he pulls his coat down like this. And it's just covered with blood. And the, <gasps> the audience can't believe it. But Roosevelt went on with his speech, spoke for about 45 minutes, bleeding the whole time. And, uh, of course, this loss of blood causes his mind to sort of fog up. And he starts talking about when he was a little boy. And he's talking to people that have long since been dead. And one of his aides came out and got him by the arm and said, Colonel, you got to go to the hospital. And they take him to the hospital. And Roosevelt is an old man, but, but he's not young. Uh, they dug the bullet out, okay, sewed him up. And 48 hours, uh, four days, excuse me, in four days, he was back on the uh, campaign trail uh, giving uh, Wilson uh, heck. And uh, it didn't make any difference. Except this now. Wilson wins. Woodrow Wilson wins. And you don't have to write these numbers down, but I'll just show you how the election went. Wilson got six six million popular votes. Did popular votes elect the president? Yeah. But he got 435 electoral votes, okay? How many does it take to win? 270. So he had more than enough. That's Woodrow Wilson. TR finished second with four million votes. Uh, four million votes, and he got 88 electoral votes, which was pretty good for a third party. And poor Taft, the Republican, finished third. Uh, he got uh, three million votes, and I think he got eight electoral votes. Okay, so that was the end of Taft and Roosevelt's political career. But I want you to observe this. Look at this right here. Get this down. Seven million people 
Get this down. The majority of the people that voted, and this is going to come back to haunt Wilson later, 7 million people that voted in that election <laughs> voted for someone else other than Wilson. In other words, Wilson is what is called the minority president. He becomes president, uh, but he doesn't win a majority of the votes because 7 million people voted for someone else. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was a minority. People say, well, that hurt him. No, it won't hurt him a bit. Abraham Lincoln was a minority president. I was just discussing this election, sixth hour. We're doing the Civil War in sixth hour. In, in 1860, Lincoln got 39% of the vote. The, the, the 30, only less than 40% of the people that voted in that election voted for Lincoln. Uh, the problem for the others, though, is there were three other candidates, and they divided the 60% between them, and Lincoln is called a plurality. He had the majority vote. All these other guys got 20-something percent, and Lincoln got 39. But most of the people who voted in 1860 said, we don't want Lincoln to be president. Thank goodness for the plurality. Thank goodness that we don't decide the presidency through the popular vote. Lincoln wanted to save the country in the slavery of the a lot of wonderful, wonderful, spectacular created the country you live in today. But that's a topic for another day. Well, anyway, get this down. Uh, Wilson won. Wilson won. Teddy Roosevelt had split the party. And, it, it allowed, and by the way, there hadn't been a Democrat in the White House since before the Civil War. Well, that's not true. Since uh, before the turn of the century. Uh, uh, Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland uh, was the last Democrat in 1892. Anyway, um, so Roosevelt had split the Republican Party and call, caused them to lose. And to get this down, uh, Roosevelt's back, and to get this down, Roosevelt's back in 1916. He loses in 1912. He's back in 1916. And he wanted the Republican nomination for president. What did the Republican Party do? And remember, this guy had been the most popular Republican ever. What did the Republican Party tell Roosevelt in 1916? Uh, you know, Why? You caused us to lose in 1912. Get out of here. Are you kidding me? And a lot of people believe that Roosevelt was running again. So that's in 1916. A lot of people believe that four years later, Roosevelt was going to try and be the Republican nominee. Uh, but he didn't never he didn't make it. You know, the next election was 1920. Roosevelt got this down. Died in 1919. Roosevelt died in 1919. <clears throat> he was sitting up in his bed reading. Well, he is this. Roosevelt, as you know, never had good health. And like I say, he's not an old man. He dies when he's 59. I know that seems ancient to you, but that's not ancient. Roosevelt wasn't an old man, but he wasn't a young man, and plus he had health problems all of his life. But when he's about 56 years old, in between runs for president, his sons, you know them, they're all grown men with children of their own, Roosevelt has grandchildren, they decided to go down to South America, and there was a river that went off of the Amazon, it was called the River of Doubt. No white man, the, the natives who lived there certainly had seen the mouth of the River of Doubt, but no white man had ever seen it. And so they're going to get in these canoes, a group of them, and they're going to go and try and find the mouth of the River of Doubt. And so they get deep in the jungles, and they're looking and looking. And Roosevelt, I think he uh, was walking and walked too close to a, a bamboo uh, cane there, a piece of bamboo stick, and it sliced his leg, and he got a terrible infection. And he almost died up there on the banks of the river. In fact, he, he, you know, he told his sons, you know, get out of here. Just leave me here. I'm not going to make it. But his sons didn't leave their father. So eventually they bring him out, and he comes back to the United States. They never did find the mouth of the River of Doubt. They did, and others have since. They never did. But that river today in South America is called the Theodore Roosevelt. It's called the Roosevelt River, okay, named after him. But his health never recovered after that. And three years later... Uh, he's uh, up in his bed reading just before he goes to sleep, and his butler came in and said, is there anything else that you need? And Roosevelt said uh, the last words anybody ever heard him say was, James, that was the butler, James, turn out the light. And James turned out the light. Roosevelt went to sleep. He died in his sleep. And, of course, get this down. There was worldwide mourning 
There was worldwide mourning. There was sorrow all over this country and sorrow all over the world. That doesn't mean everybody liked him. That doesn't mean everybody agreed with him. But there was sorrow all over the world. Woodrow Wilson was president. Woodrow Wilson's vice president, a guy named Marshall. I'm going to have to write him down, but just to show you the response, Marshall was walking out of the Senate. He had been presiding over the Senate. That's what the Constitution says the vice president does. And he was walking out of the Senate at the end of the Senate session, and reporters rushed up and said, did you hear? And he said, what? And they said, Teddy Roosevelt died last night. And Marshall's response was this, and it's pretty typical. Marshall said, last night, they said, yes, he died in his sleep. And Marshall said, well, it's a good thing that he was asleep. It's a good thing that death, when death came for his way, it was a good thing when death came for Roosevelt, that Roosevelt would have, was asleep, else death would have had a fight on its hands, okay? And that sort of sums up, uh, that sort of sums up Roosevelt. So he died in sleep. And by the way, he was buried on a very cold and, miserable rainy day at Sagamore Hill, that home that I just showed you. And uh, in those days, they had real grave diggers. They took a shovel. They didn't have a backhoe to come in. They had guys dug your grave with a with a shovel. And uh, so when the mourners had all gone away, and just the grave diggers were up there, under the rains pouring down, just the grave diggers were up there, and they noticed the grave people getting in their cars down there at the bottom of the hill. Uh, the grave diggers are starting to fill in the grave and they noticed that there was this big hulking guy standing there with the grave diggers and he was crying so hard that his shoulders were shaking who was that taft, taft. william howard taft yeah i don't think he and roosevelt were ever reconciled but uh, yeah the 19th election if nothing else and it's a lot else but if nothing else the 1912 election was the end of a great friendship taft and roosevelt just to fill you just to put a cap on this taft and roosevelt only met one other time after that. Uh, Roosevelt was staying in the same hotel as Taft, and neither one knew that they were in the same hotel. And Taft had an engagement, a speech or something, and he was walking through the lobby to go out and get in his car, and he just happened to glance off to the side, and there in the dining room, sitting at a table by himself, was Teddy Roosevelt. And he walked in and sat down for about 10 minutes. Uh, and nobody knows what they said because they were both asked about it, but they took it to their graves. Neither one of them ever said what they said, but that was the only time they saw each other. In the seven years, and these were best friends, in the seven years between the election of 1912 and Roosevelt's death in 1919. So, anyway, get this down. Let's go to the Woodrow Wilson administration. Woodrow Wilson. And let's talk about him. Okay, uh, Woodrow Wilson, as you know, was a Democrat. And what's the most important thing that happened in Woodrow Wilson's presidency in World War One? World War One. If you don't have that down, get it down. I'm going to say a lot of things about Woodrow Wilson, and a lot of things happened during his presidency. But the most important thing, the most significant thing that happens during Wilson's presidency is World War One. Get all this information down. Wilson is president. He's elected in 1912. He's sworn in in 1913, and he will be president until 1921. Okay. During his presidency, see, World War One happens, and we'll talk about World War One. I. I mean, when I came back, I didn't think we would get to World War One. We progressed quite nicely, and so I'm delighted that we're going to get to World War One. Wish we could get to World War Two. You want to hear that? Take the American History II next year. We'll start with World War II. And nobody should get a high school diploma that doesn't know about World War II. You know, if you don't know about World War II, you just got you just have a, a piece of paper. Okay? It's about as worthless as I don't know. I don't see anything as worthless as a high school diploma without a knowledge of World War II. Can you tear off the corner of that piece of paper? It's a little tiny corner, I don't know much. If you don't know about World War II when you graduate, they don't hand you that that's about what your high school diploma will be worth. But don't take my word for it. You're all headed to the classroom of the greatest teacher that ever taught. Experience. Just wait till it gets a hold of you. 
you'll need your education and everything else. And I know, I always teach geniuses. They've got it all figured out. <laughs> good luck. Anyway, World War One, and if that offends you, good. Anyway, 1914 to 1918, that's the war. By the way, when did we get involved? Some of you are going to do okay. What? What? 1917. That's an educated guess. 1915. 1915. That's an educated guess. 1917. What? 1917. That's an educated guess. That's right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Running out of options here. Yeah. Hey, we're not in this war very long. We declare war in 1917. We don't get any troops over there until the summer of 1918. And guess what? About four months after we get there, the war's over. So we're barely in the war. What about World War II? 1939 to 1945. When did we get involved? Yeah, well, 41 was almost over. Only, only, you're right. You're right. It's only 23 days left in 1941 when the Japanese go. We didn't get 42. We're only there for half of that. I was sitting in. At a train station one time and outside of London, and I was going out to Oxford. And if you go to England, go to Oxford. And all of you go to England, you ought to do it. And by the way, every one of you can do it. But anyway, it's very expensive. But anyway, this lady was there with a this British woman was there with a big box. And you know, I said something to somebody. I went to the ticket window and asked about the train set. And so she could tell by my accent I was an American. Oh, you're an American. Said, yeah. And she said, and I said, what's up? You know, we got to talk. And she said, well, she said, I'm on. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Oxford. And she said, well, I'm going to Oxford too. Her son was a student at Oxford. And it was his birthday. She was taking him a birthday cake of all things. But anyway, when I said, yes, I'm an American, she looked at me and she said, oh, yes, yes. She said, you're the people that came late. Talking about World War II. And she was right. We don't get there in 1942. I said, yeah, we can wait, but if it weren't for us, you'd be saying you'd be taking that uh, cake to a Hitler birthday party. Yeah, she was right. She was right. Anyway, that was our birthday cake. Anyway, we don't get involved in 1917, but that's the most important thing that happens during the uh, presidency of Woodrow Wilson. So we get all this down. That's the one at the door. Gosh, they're coming in at all hours of the night and day. <laughs> Come on in. Anyway, got this down. Wilson was a southerner. He was the first southerner elected since before the Civil War. Because the South had rebelled against the Union and tried to destroy this country, the American people wouldn't elect southerners. Wilson's the first one. By the way, you've got this to put out there for us. Wilson was from Virginia. He was a Virginia. <clears throat> and by the way, the Civil War profoundly affected his life. Listen, he didn't have to take a class about the Civil War. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, get this, Woodrow Wilson experienced the Civil War. Wilson's father was a Presbyterian minister. They were from Virginia. And when Wilson was a little boy, listen, Wilson saw the Civil War. You didn't have to read about it. When he was a little boy, his father took a church down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And Woodrow Wilson, this little boy, stood down in the basement of that church with other little boys and their mothers, and they, he helped roll up clean, wash out bloody bandages, wash them out, and re-roll those bandages for wounded Confederate soldiers. You remember General Sherman taking Atlanta and marching to the sea? He saw that. So, so, so the Civil War was not just some academic exercise for Wilson. He had lived through it. And I want you to write this down. It profoundly influenced him. And you're going to see that. I also want you to write this down about Wilson. He was devoutly religious. Devout, he was very religious. He saw God's hand in everything. When he ran for president in 1912, some of his aides said to him, you ought to go to the Democrat convention and shake a few hands so they'll nominate you for president. And he said, God is going to choose the nominee of the Democrat Party. He wouldn't go to the convention, and guess what? The convention nominated Woodrow Wilson, and who did Woodrow Wilson believe had nominated him for president? God. Right. God. And then he won the election, and who did he believe had made him president of the United States? God. God. That's pretty dangerous, if you ask me. You know, God. 
Now, I want you to write this down. He was stubborn and self-righteous. He believed that other people just didn't quite measure up to him, Thomas Woodrow Wilson. And he would not compromise. You know, Teddy Roosevelt compromised on some things. Some things he wouldn't, but Wilson wouldn't compromise. You know, it's been said that, that and he's going to fail, by the way. He's going to fail. It's been said that politics is the art of compromise. Well, I want to tell you what, and you know, people can disagree. That's one of the greatest things we have in this country is the right to disagree. You can say, I think every woman has the right of choice. I have, if a woman becomes pregnant, I think she has the right to choose whether or not she will carry that pregnancy to term. But you can say <laughs> abortion is murder, it's the taking of, a, it's killing a baby, and it ought to be at bed. You can believe either one of those, and you can still be civil toward each other. You can still be friends. Friends disagree, don't they, on occasion? Yeah. Family members disagree on occasion, don't they? Yeah, but they're still a family, and they're still not Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson got this down. If you disagree with him, he didn't just think you were wrong. He believed you were evil. I can't stand Woodrow Wilson. Um he believed you were evil. And by the way, he's very controlled. He's very controlled. He didn't <coughs> show his emotions. People that knew him, people that knew Wilson, you know, he would be talking just as calmly as I am right now. He would be about, about to explode. The people that knew him, people who were close to him, knew if a vein came up in his head. He was just going to have a vein come up in his head. Or he always carried pencils. He talked. If this was the Oval Office and you all were in there, you were a group of senators and you were talking about the next tax bill, Wilson would be just sitting here with his pencil. And when he finally got so angry with you, and you wouldn't know it, he'd just talk to you just like this. He would snap that pencil. And when he snapped the pencil, he better back off, okay? He kept all that inside. He never let his emotions out. What killed him? A stroke. Yeah. You understand there comes that day when you have to you need to get a bucket of sand, a little bucket of sand, and you need to go out uh, in a field about 50 acres with nobody within 50 acres of you. And you just take that bucket of sand and you just spin around and spin around and spin around and spin around and, spin around and, then, and let it go and yell, damn it! Just a And then, you know, you know somebody got to go back to work now. Wilson never did that. Try that at home. You don't have a bucket, throw your old brother. <laughs> <laughs> your old your little brother Rudd. Anyway. Yeah. So uh it killed him. Yeah, it killed him. Well, I'm about to take some students up to D.C. and we go to the National Cathedral. He's just buried there. You, can, I've seen people sit on top of this, uh, you know, little monument here, Woodrow. You know, and I, and I always tell them they should have put on the side of that, killed by the presidency. The presidency killed him. Get this down. Listen quickly. We're out of time. Wilson was an outsider. You know, one of Donald Trump's appeals. And I'm not saying that Woodrow Wilson is Donald Trump, and I'm not saying that Donald Trump is Woodrow Wilson. They're two very different people. But they do have this one similarity. A large reason that they were both elected is that they were outsiders. They hadn't been in government before. Wilson had never held an office. Well, he had held one office. Get this down. He had been governor of New Jersey. But most of Woodrow Wilson's life, he was a teacher. And he was an academician. Write this down. <laughs> Yes. Well, when the class is over, you can have a seat. Anyway, Wilson, you can then sit down, but uh, you know, I'm teaching a class right now. But anyway, uh, Wilson, all of his life, had been a teacher. He had been an academician. He was a political science professor. I know a little bit about that. I'm a political science minor. I'm a history major, political science minor. Uh, he is, apparently was an excellent teacher. His classes were always full. Uh, he tended to look down on politicians, get that down. But he's an outsider. He hasn't spent his whole life in government and in politics. Donald Trump had never been elected to a school board when he became, he never held an office when he became president. He 
said, I'm an outsider. Donald Trump said, I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. as an outsider, and I'm going to clean it up. He called it the swamp, okay? Woodrow Wilson, same thing. He said, I'm going to go clean Washington, D.C. up. Uh, and he died trying to do that. Let me tell you, you know, in other words, I'm going, to, I'm going to reform the system. Let me tell you something. Presidents come and presidents go, <clears throat> but the system remains, okay? And Wilson took on the system, uh, and it killed him. Now, he, he did have some successes, but he's going to leave office a broken man, and within a year, maybe two at the most, but I don't think it was, within a year, uh, he was dead. Within a year, he was dead. Um, he was the first president, get this down, he was the first president since John Adams, since John Adams to actually appear before the Congress and make a speech. You know, you've got George Washington, you've got John Adams. The Constitution here, the rule book says that once a year the president will go over, it says once a year the president will report to the Congress on the State of the Union. How's the country doing? Well, George Washington read that, and he put on his own Revolutionary War uniform, and he went over to the Congress, and he said, this is how the country's doing, his person. He did that eight times. He, was, he served two terms. He did that eight times. Then John Adams was elected president, and John Adams said, well, Washington went over and talked to them about it, so I will too. Adams served one term, but four times he went, four times he went to over to the Congress and reported on how the country was doing. But then came the third president, Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson uh, is the president of the United States from 1801 until 1809. And Jefferson, just like our president today, President Biden, Jefferson stuttered. He could write magnificently. You ought to read the Declaration of Independence. There's a book about the Declaration. Every American ought to read it. It's called American Scripture. It's magnificent the way that he wrote, but he was embarrassed to speak in public. So Jefferson read the Constitution and said, you know what? It just says that I've got to report to the Congress. It doesn't say I've got to go do it in person. So Jefferson wrote out how the country was doing, sent it over to the Congress. The Congress assembled and the clerk stood there and said, this is a message from the president and read it. And there would not be another, pre from 1801 until 1913, get this down, no president ever appeared before the Congress. They do all the time now, but Lincoln never went in front of the Congress. Grover Cleveland never went in front of the Congress. Teddy Roosevelt never went over to the Congress and made a speech until Woodrow Wilson, get this down. <coughs> and Woodrow Wilson was a teacher. And he said, I'm going to go over and I'm going to instruct these people as to what they ought to do. And he delivered, listen, he delivered his state. Didn't have to, but he delivered his State of the Union message in, per, uh, in person, not on purpose, but well, on purpose too, I guess. In person, okay? He delivered the State of the Union in person. And look, every president since 1913 has done that. Joe Biden just did it back a couple of months ago, a few weeks ago in January, okay? So he, uh, you know, is the, uh, he, he revived the custom of going over and giving the State of the Union message. And then write this down. He showed the very first movie. We're talking about first with Woodrow Wilson. He showed the very first movie ever shown in the White House. And the name of that movie, get this down, the name of that movie was The Birth of a Nation. Put that in quotes. It's a title. The Birth of of a nation. And uh, the next time I lecture, which probably won't be tomorrow, because if you do this essay test right, you will be, if you ride a bus, you can leave. Uh, if you do this essay test right, it'll take you most of the period tomorrow. The home study tonight, be prepared. But the next time I lecture, we'll take up the birth of a nation. If you ride the bus, you may go. If you go here, come out.
<laughs> you want me to end your video? I'm sorry, Andrew. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, I appreciate you doing it. I'm going to run it all over.